Welcome to Engineering Studio with Dr. Muhammad Tahir. In this video, we are going to discuss about the design of two-way slab for shear. Okay, first of all, we need to discuss what will be the shear in beam. So, our beams with alpha f flexible stiffness ratio greater than one shear is calculated by 45 degree tributary area as shown in figure. So, if the stiffness ratio of beam is greater than one. In that case, we will calculate the shear force that will be resisted by the beam by using tributary area at 45 degree. So 45 degree here, 45 degree. So this much area will be supported by this beam and the load of this area will be transferred from this slab to the beam. And this load will act as a shear force or shear load. But if the stiffness of beam is less than one, so in that case, we cannot use this concept, the concept of 45 degree tributary area. So in that case, we need to linearly interpolate the values between this value one and assuming that the shear force is zero when the flexural stiffness ratio of beam is zero. So we will have this like condition like that, for example, alpha f is equal to one are greater than one. So in that case, we will have the value of shear. Similarly, if alpha f is equal to zero, so we will have a value equal to zero. So we need to calculate for any one, any value in between zero and one. For example, if alpha f is 0 0.5, so then we need to interpolate the values between these two cases. Shear produced by directly applied force load on beam should also be added to the above calculated shear force. So any load which is acting directly on this beam, for example, the load of wall above it, so that will also be considered along with the load from the slab. So the load of slab plus the line load acting on this beam will be considered to calculate the shear force in beam. Next is affected movement in the column and wall. So columns and walls built integrally with the slab system should resist movement caused by the factor loads on the slab. So the bending movement of the slab will be transferred to the column or the wall supporting that beam. If that column or wall are integrally built with the slab system. So for interior columns or walls above and below the slab should resist the factor movement specified specified by the following equation. So we will calculate the value of movement transferred from the slab to the column in case of interior columns. Okay, so this in this equation QDU is factor dead load, QLU is factor live load, uniformly distributed live load, and this L2 is transfer span and LN is clear span between the spores from this spore to this spore, clear span. And Q dash is again dead load, factor dead load, but for the shorter panel. Actually when we calculate this unbalanced moment, we considered that on the longer span, there act dead load plus half of the live load. But on the shorter span, there only act dead load. So for shorter span, span as well as the load will be denoted by the dash value. So Q dead load is dead load acting on the shorter span. L2 is the width of the shorter span. And LN dash is the span of this shorter panel. Okay, for this unbalanced movement should be resisted by this column, by the interior column. So if there is only column, one only column below this slab, in that case all the unbalanced movement will be resisted by this column. But if there exists column above that slab as well, so in that case this unbalanced movement will be resisted by this column at the bottom and the column at the top. And the 
magnitude of this unbalanced moment resisted by these two columns will depend upon their stiffness ratio. If both columns have equal stiffness, so in that case, half of the moment will be resisted by the bottom column and half will be resisted by the above. But if their stiffness ratio is different, so the distribution of this moment will be proportion to their stiffness. A column with larger stiffness ratio or the larger stiffness value will resist the larger portion of the unbalanced moment and the column with lesser stiffness will resist the lesser amount of the unbalanced moment or lesser portion of the unbalanced moment. In case of edge column, the gravity load moment should be transferred between slab and edge column is to be 0 0.3 m naught. So for this edge column, whatsoever is a st static moment m naught over here, it's 30 percent will be resisted, will be transferred to the edge column. So here the unbalanced moment will be equal to 0 0.3 times m naught. Okay, detail, design and detailing of the reinforcement transferring the moment from slab to the edge column is critical to both performance and safety of slab or flat slab or flat plates without edge beams. So if there is no edge beam in case of edge column, so in that case we need to design the reinforcement to resist the unbalanced moment which is 0.3 m naught or to transfer this unbalanced moment from slab to column. And that reinforcement should be provided within this effective area so which is C2 mean this dimension transverse dimension from this span plus 2 times 1.5 h. So 1.5 h will be from this face up to this one and same on the other side. So total this width, effective width will be C2 plus 2 times 1.5 h or 3 h. So in this width we need to provide some extra reinforcement to resist that unbalanced moment which need to be transferred from slab to the edge column. Next is one way shear in slab. So it is a beam type shear leading to tension, leading to diagonal tension failure. So this type of shear is similar to the shear in case of beams and it causes diagonal tension failure. So if we see in case of beams we have the scenario like this if here we have a spot so a diagonal crack appear at about 45 degree and cause the failure. So in case of slab failure will be similar in case of Labs. It will be, uh, it will be due to a diagonal crack, and this diagonal crack will extend throughout the width of this slab. So applicable particularly, particularly to long, narrow slabs or footings. So in case of one-way slab, or in case of cantilevered slab, one-way shear can be critical, or in case of strip footing, it is critical. So in case of strip footing, we have scenario like this. So this much portion act as a slab, one way slab so shear can be, shear crack can develop over here in this manner. Slab act as a white beam as we have seen earlier. So it spans between the spores provided by the column strips. A potential diagonal crack extend in a plane across entire width of slab. So the crack will appear in the entire width of this slab. The critical section is taken at a distance d. So the critical section we take at a distance d from the face of the sport. From the face of column or column capital. The applied share in this case can be calculated q u times half of the span minus distance. The critical distance from the face of the sport. And the nominal shear in case of one way shear is given by Vc is equal to 2 times square 
root fc prime bwd and here bw is the width of slab this much width width of slab next is two ways are punching shear in slabs a shear acting all along the perimeter of a column for a flat slab without beams can punch the column into the slab and it is termed as two way or punching shear so it act all along the column so that's why it is termed as two way shear and it can punch the column from this slab just like this so a column has been punched out of this slab so that's why we can term it as a punching shear so in case of punching shear a pyramid type shape is separated out of the slab because of the diagonal cracks so if we see it will be like this here we have a spot so a diagonal crack will appear in this direction as well as in this direction so this much portion a pyramid type portion will be separated out of this slab the failure surface surface extend from bottom of slab at the spot diagonally upward to the top surface so crack will start from here and it will extend in upward direction at about 45 degree angle so the angle of inclination with the horizontal theta it depends upon the nature and amount of reinforcement and its magnitude can be between 20 to 45 degree larger the reinforcement provided in the slab particularly the shear reinforcement the smaller will be the angle and this inclination will reduce the critical section for shear is taken perpendicular to the plane of a slab at a distance d by 2 so in case of one way slab we consider the critical section at a distance d but in case of two way slab we consider the critical section at a distance d by 2 so from the face of the column up to a distance d by 2 the critical section will lie so we will assume that the crack will appear at that location okay here different scenarios are shown for the critical section in case of rectangular column the critical section will be at a distance d by 2 from the face of the column on both sides in case of interior column but in case of edge column so the critical section will be at a distance d by 2 on this side and on this side as well as on this side but on the edge side there will be no critical section so only the critical section will be on three sides and in case of circular column this that critical section will be at a distance d by 2 from the face of the column and this d is actually the effective depth of slab and in case of column with the star shape or plus shape so the critical section will be at a distance d by 2 from this face from this face and from this face and then we can join that critical section with this inclined lines and if we see the distance of this inclined line as well as the distance and if we draw this line and this line the distance will be again d by 2 but in case of slabs flat slabs with drop panel we have two critical section we may have two critical section so we need to investigate which one is the critical so one we take the critical section at this location from a at a distance d by 2 from the face of the column and the second is considered at a distance d by 2 from the edge of this drop panel so at a distance d by 2 at the edge of this drop panel as well as at a distance d by 2 from the face of the column so we consider two critical sections in case of slab with drop panel so there are two types of punching shear one is direct shear and other one is indirect or eccentric shear so direct shear is a shear which is produced by the vertical loads so it is produced by the vertical loads and having constant value or constant intensity so its value will be constant all along the perimeter or all along the critical section so it is termed as direct shear so we can calculate the value of direct shear 
by multiplying the QU or the uniformly distributed load with the area uh, tributary area for that column minus the area within this critical section. So L1 into L2 is actually the tributary area for this interior column and B1, B2 is B1 is the dimension of critical section along C1 and B2 is the dimension or width of the critical section along C2 and B1 times B2 will be the area in between this critical section. So this will give us the value of applied direct shear. So only the area outside this critical section or uh, the only the load outside this critical section will be considered to cause the direct shear. So if we see the this is the shear value shear force and if we see the shear stress so we need to divide it by B naught D. The perimeter of the critical section times diameter so it will give us actually the area of all these four faces. So this area of all these four faces will be actually the area which is in shear or which is resisting the applied shear. So Vu divided by B naught D will give us the shear stress value, applied shear stress value. So next is eccentric shear. So eccentric shear is the one which is produced by the transfer of unbalanced moment from slab to the column. So the portion of that unbalanced moment is transferred to the column in two ways. Some portion of that unbalanced moment is transferred by the direct bending and some portion is transferred by the torsion. So if we see this picture here and for example our slab is like this in this direction and we are considering this pen. So the balance, unbalancing moment from in this direction that need to be transferred from slab to the column. So some of its portion will be transferred to the slab by direct bending and that will be resisted by this phase. So on this phase the moment will be resisted by the bending but on this phase here the moment will be resisted by the torsion. For example, if we consider that this slab is not connected or this portion, this slab is not connected with this column in this portion. Here we have a hole. So in that case, only this portion and this portion uh, will be, this portion of the slab or the slab will be connected with the column from these sides, these two sides. And all the bending moment will be transferred from this side and when this beam will bend or the slab will bend in this direction so here it will cause rotation, rotation of this edge, similarly rotation of this edge. So be because of the rotation of this edge, shear stresses will develop along this perimeter. So these shear stresses will be having linear magnitude which vary from sun tried or the point of rotation to the extreme fibers. So here in this portion we will have a transfer of unbalanced moment due to bending but from this phase there we will have a transfer of unbalanced moment because of torsion. And so because of that torsion or this tar that torsion will be resisted by the shear stresses. And these shear stresses will have a linear magnitude which vary from the centroid to the extreme fiber and they will have a maximum value at the farthest point. So this linearly varying shear force is our shear stress is termed as indirect or eccentric shear and its value is given by V is equal to MUV times C over JC. Here MUV is unbalanced moment transferred because of shear and C is the distance from this neutral axis up to the point where we want to calculate this shear stress and JC is actually analogous to 
polar moment of inertia it is the geometrical property and it is analogous to polar moment of inertia and if we see this equation is similar to sigma is equal to m y over i here m is the moment y is the distance from the neutral axis and i is the second moment of area so this figure shows the distribution of this eccentric shear or indirect shear so it varies linearly from the centroid so at the extreme ends it will have maximum value but at the center it will have zero value and this stress is produced because of the torque so the moment unbalanced moment is transferred to the column by this torque and because of this unbalanced moment or this torque a shear stresses will appear at this critical section So in that equation, V is equal to M U V C over J C. So M U V is unbalanced moment transferred by the shear. So it is given by M U V is given by gamma V times M U. And we have already seen how we can calculate this unbalanced moment that is transferred from slab to the column. So gamma V is equal to 1 minus gamma F and gamma F can be calculated by this equation. This is given in ACI code and it depends on the ratio of sides of the critical section. So B1 is the dimension of critical section in this direction and B2 will be the perpendicular to this. So after finding the value of gamma V, if we substitute it over here, so unbalanced moment will become or the unbalanced moment transfer to the shear will be due to the shear will be equal to 1 minus 1 over 1 plus 2 by 3 square root b1 over b2 times mu unbalanced moment and the portion of the unbalanced moment transferred by the flagger is equal to mub times gamma f mu gamma f is the factor that we can calculate by using this equation and mu is the total unbalanced moment And JC is the property of critical section and it is analogous to polar moment of inertia. And we can either we can calculate its value. So JC is equal to actually IX plus IY. It is analogous to polar moment of inertia. And we can calculate its value. And in ACI code, this equation is given. By using this equation, we can calculate the value of this JC factor. The, and this equation is for interior columns where we have critical section on all four sides but in case of edge columns we have critical section on three sides only and in case of interior columns centroid will lie at the center center of this face but in case of edge columns centroid will be will not be at the center of this face it will be off center so it will not be over here it will be away from this point so we need to calculate the centroid for these three shapes and then we can calculate this JC factor. So for centroid the distance from this centroid up to the face is x1 we can calculate by using this equation and similarly the JC value can be calculated by using the second equation for edge columns. So I am not going into detail how we can calculate it or how we can develop this equation so we can directly use this equation given in the ACI code. Okay, next is total share. So as we see that there exist two type of share. One is direct share and other one is indirect share. So the question is how we can combine these two shares. So if we see their profile, so this is the profile of eccentric share and this is the profile of direct share. Direct share is constant but the eccentric share is linear. On one side it has a downward direction but on the other side it has a upward direction. So if we see for this right side, so here the direction of these two, this one and this one are downward, so on this side it will be added up. So we can add the direct share VU over AC and the indirect share MUC over J. But on the other side here the direction is upward and here the direction is downward, so here these will be 
subtracted so on left side it is subtracted and on the right side it is added so it will be the case when we are considering the span on the right side or uh, if the movement or the span of the right side is longer than that of left and the direction of movement is in this direction then this case will prevail otherwise it might be opposite to that if the direction of movement or the direction of unbalanced movement is in this direction if this span is larger than this one then it will be reversed okay so on left side we need to subtract and on right side we need to add up these values and here ac is the area of this critical section so area of this critical section so this will be perimeter time the depth so ac is the area of critical section and it is perimeter time depth so 2 times c1 plus d and c2 plus d c1 plus d is actually we see over here so this one is the column so this is c1 this is c2 so critical section will lie over here at a distance d by 2 so this dimension will be equal to c2 plus d by 2 from this side and d by 2 from the other side on this side so it will be equal to b2 similarly this on this side in this direction it will be c1 plus d by 2 because the critical section is at a distance d by 2 d by 2 plus d by 2 and it will be equal to b1 so if we want to find the parameter so it will be equal to 2 times b1 plus b2 and if we want to calculate the area then we need to multiply it by d so this is for h column and in, oh, sorry, for interior column for h column we have only twice of b1 and in case of b2 we don't have twice because we have critical section only on one side of the column in case of h columns or exterior columns and cl and cr are the distances from the centroid to the left and right side so this is centroid cent from distance from the centroid up to this face or distance from centroid up to this face okay so we have seen how we can calculate the applied two way shear so the resistive two way shear or the resistive shear provided by the resistance provided by the concrete to resist the applied punching shear is given by these three equations so we can select the lesser out of these three values so these are the values are the equations given by the aci code so we need to select the least value out of these three so in the first equation vc is equal to 0.171 1 plus 2 over beta so here beta is the longer to shorter side of the column so it is not for the slab it is for the column longer to shorter ratio of longer to shorter side lambda is a factor which accounts for the lightweight concrete for normal weight concrete its value is 1 otherwise we can see its value from the aci code so fc prime is the specified compressive strength of concrete b not is the parameter of critical section d is the effective depth similarly here only this alpha s factor is different so this alpha s is given by these three values alpha f is 40 for interior columns 30 for edge column and 20 for corner columns and if we divide this vc by b not d so we can convert it into stress so if we divide this equation by b not d so this b not d will be cancelled out out of all these three equation and we will left with this vc shear stress shear stress instead of shear force okay next is design equation so the basic design equation is applied shear force or shear stress should be less than the resistive shear stress or the design design shear capacity of the slab 
and in case of applied shear force or shear stress we have direct shear plus indirect shear and in case of resistive shear or design capacity of the slab we have the shear provided by this concrete or shear stress shear strength provided by the concrete and shear strength provided by the steel if we have steel reinforcement for the shear to resist the shear okay so if there is no shear reinforcement in that case vs will be equal to 0 and our design shear will be only because of the concrete resistance if this vu is greater than 5 vc so in that case we need to provide the shear reinforcement and the value of this shear force should be less than 0 0.33 square root fc prime b naught d if the value of shear that need to be resisted by the steel reinforcement is greater than this value then we need to change the dimensions of the slab we need to increase its thickness or we need to provide the column capitals or drop panels and in that case if we provide the shear reinforcement our resistive shear by the concrete should be less than 0 0.17 square root fc prime b naught d so we need to fulfill these two conditions if we provide the shear reinforcement so there are different ways to provide shear reinforcement in case of two-way slabs so we can all use this reinforcement cage like beam inside the slab as a concealed beam or otherwise we can use these structural shapes to resist the shear we can provide the shear studs or we can provide the reinforcement in just like the bend up bars so on this side it will start from the bottom and then go up and then go bottom so just like the bend up technique we can provide this reinforcement to resist the shear